Good evening and uh, welcome to all of you. I'm Alex Jones. I'm director of the Joan Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy. And I'm very happy to welcome you here tonight. Uh, normally, David Elwood would be the person standing up here saying these things, but he is uh, under the weather and uh, has asked to uh, have, his, have his welcome passed on by me. Um, this is a big night for the Shorenstein Center. Uh, it's a highlight of our year, without question. We are now marking our 26th anniversary. As some of you already know, the Shorenstein Center was founded in 1986 as a memorial to Joan Shorenstein Barone, a truly remarkable television journalist who died of breast cancer after a distinguished career. Her father, Walter Shorenstein, endowed the center as a place for a focused and searching examination of the intersection of press, politics, and public policy. Walter Shorenstein not only made the center possible, but remained vitally interested in what we do and was our unstinting supporter and friend. Two years ago, after a long and extraordinary life, he died at 95, and we miss and mourn him. He was above all else a great citizen, and the Theodore White Lecture and the David Nyan Prize are to recognize that same kind of, ex of engaged activist citizenship from a journalistic perspective. With us tonight are Walter's son, Doug Shorenstein, and daughter, Carol Shorenstein Hayes. Please join me in expressing appreciation and respect to the Shorenstein family. A bit later, you will hear from our Theodore White lecturer, David Brooks. But first, I have another task to perform, which is also an honor. In 2005, we at the Shorenstein Center lost another great and much admired friend, David Nyan. Many of you do not know David, and I want to speak of him briefly as we this year bestow the eighth annual David Nyan Prize for political journalism. David Nyan was a man of many parts, a devoted family man, a loyal pal, best company in the world. I can still feel the glow he imparted as a fellow at the Shorenstein Center. Tonight we honor David Nyan, the consummate reporter and political journalist, which is the role that occupied much of his life and at which he could not be bested. David was a reporter and then a columnist at the Boston Globe, and his work had both a theme and a character. The theme was almost always power, political power, and also especially the abuse of political power by the big shots at the expense of the little guys. He also loved politicians. Were he with us today, he would have just been coming off the 15-round brutal slugfest for the White House, which he would have engaged tooth and claw. But he would not have been predictable. He was always surprising his readers with his take on things because most of all, David Nyan was his own man and he called them as he saw them. In his memory and honor, the Nyan family and many friends and admirers of David Nyan have endowed the David Nyan Prize for Political Journalism to recognize the kind of gutsy, stylish, relentless journalism that David Nyan embodied. Dave's wife, Olivia, is with us tonight, as are his children, Veronica, Kate, and Nick, and other members of the Nyan family. Please join me in expressing our regard and affection. <laughs> this year's David Nyan Prize for Political Journalism is awarded to Cynthia Tucker, I doubt there is a single person in this room who has not read To Kill a Mockingbird. It's set in a small town in Alabama that is remarkably like the town that its author, Harper Lee, grew up in, Monroeville. You will recall that Harper Lee's next door neighbor in the summer was a little boy named Truman Capote. I don't know what they put in the water in Monroeville, but it must be a powerful writing elixir because that is also the hometown of Cynthia Tucker, who was born there in the days when the town was still right out of To Kill a Mockingbird. Cynthia went to segregated schools until she was 17. And I would bet that living the civil rights movement, literally living it, had a lot to do with her making 
with making her one of the South's and the nation's most vibrant liberal voices. She graduated from Auburn University and then went to work for the Atlanta Journal Constitution back in the days when it was literally true that the paper sit on its masthead covers Dixie like the dew. That's no longer true. <laughs> In 1980, she left the Journal Constitution to go to the Philadelphia Inquirer, which at that time, under editor Gene Roberts, also a Southerner, was regarded as one of the nation's small handful of truly outstanding newspapers. She wanted to go to Africa as a foreign correspondent, and when the Inquirer ruled her too inexperienced, she got the experience by quitting the paper and going to Africa as a freelancer. When she returned, it was to Atlanta, where she settled. She had an op-ed column, and she was home. She was a Neiman Fellow here at Harvard, became editorial page editor in Atlanta, and in 2007, she was awarded a Pulitzer Prize for commentary. She's won, won many other awards and was recently named to the Hall of Fame by the National Association of Black Journalists. Cynthia Tucker's style is direct and strong. She tells you what she thinks. And what she thinks is always in support of the little guy the fellow that David Nyan always championed. But she is hardly a down-the-line liberal spouting predictable views. Last month, she declared that affirmative action for college admissions was over. Quote, it's silly to suggest that President Barack Obama's daughters should get preference in college admissions, she wrote. Instead, she proposed something else. Highly selective colleges, she wrote, that, that top tier of institutions that accept only a small percentage of applicants should start offering preferences to promising students from poor and working class backgrounds, let's say family incomes under $50,000. If they did that, those institutions would still draw some racial diversity while also helping to close the large and growing chasm between the haves and the have-nots. Sounds to me just like what David Nyan might have said. It gives me great pleasure to award the 2012 David Nyan Prize for Political Journalism to Cynthia Tucker. Thank you very much. I am deeply honored to receive this award and to stand in the company of the journalist for whom it is named, and to stand in the company of those who have received it previously. I am taken by a remark that David Nyan made, that in retirement he would miss the chance to, quote, shine a little flashlight on a dark corner where wrong was done to a powerless peon where a scarred politician maybe deserved a better fate, where the process went awry, or the mob needed to be calmed down and herded in another direction. I would like to think that I've done much the same thing, though I could not have put it so eloquently. I think we've arrived at a moment when, as much as anything, the public needs the reassurance of commentary based on facts, not stereotypes, on evidence, not emotion, on empiricism, not biases. The recent election has been another powerful affirmation of a trend long underway. The browning of America and the increasing political power and social significance of darker-skinned Americans. While I see that as a continuation of the country's long heritage as a mixing bowl, if not a melting pot, many white Americans, especially older white Americans, seem terrified by it. Because I've been writing about race and ethnicity for decades, from a southern outpost, no less, I've seen that fear up close. I think of a phone call that I received years back when I was still editorial page editor at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution 
from a reader who sounded as if he were older and I surmised was a reader from South Georgia. He was upset by a series of editorials that he had read that were, you know, the same old far left liberal, nearly socialist stuff advocating full equality for women, for gays, uh, and the continuing activism for full civil rights for black and brown Americans. And in exasperation, he finally said to me, now they're just telling me that everything I learned as a child was wrong. Quite frankly, I could understand how terrified that must have made him, how jarring that must have been. But my response to that is not to say that, yes, you're right, the 1950s represent the full ascent of American democracy, and that's as far as we need to go. Instead, my response is that we need to continue to talk about these things and I will continue to write about them. Respectfully, of course, tactfully, I hope, but I will continue to write about them. I will continue to write that the Republican Party should give up on those tactics that focus on voter suppression and find ways to appeal to black and brown voters instead. I'll continue to write about the prison industrial complex and the harm it has done to black men. I'll continue to write that I have never met a child who chose to be born to a poor single mother. There may be such children, but I've never met one. And it is surely in all of our best interest to do whatever we can do to help those children to become productive and law-abiding citizens. And knowing full well that no race or ethnic group holds a monopoly on bigotry or stereotyping or simple selfishness, I will continue to write as well about influential black interests who don't wish to share power with the rising Latino stakeholders and about political leaders of every color and every stripe whose only agenda is fame and fortune, their own. I continue to have a deep and abiding faith in the journalistic enterprise, sometimes a faith that is almost a reckless enthusiasm, sometimes a faith that is more chastened, but a faith nevertheless in the simple idea that shining a light in a dark corner not only illuminates injustice, but also reminds us that we are all in this democracy together. Thank you so much for this award. Theodore H. White was a consummate reporter whose passion was politics. He came to Harvard on a Newsboys scholarship and went on to a very distinguished career as a journalist and also a historian. Indeed, Teddy White, as he was universally known, changed both political journalism and politics when he wrote The Making of the President 1960 about the Kennedy-Nixon campaign. For the first time, he raised the curtain on the warts and all side of presidential campaigns and changed campaign coverage forever. Ever since then, Teddy White's insider candor and behind the scenes drama has been a staple of campaign coverage. He followed his first book with three more, Making of the President books in 1964, 1968, and 1972. And no one has yet surpassed those smart and groundbreaking examinations of what happens and why in the maelstrom of a political campaign. It is fair, today, fair to say that Teddy White's heirs are the journalists of today who try to pierce the veil of politics to understand what is happening 
and to then analyze and deliver the goods to those of us who are trying to understand. Certainly we're in definite season for that right now. Before his death in 1986, Teddy White was one of the architects of what became the Shorenstein Center. One of the first moves of Marvin Kalb, the center's founding director, was to raise the funds and establish the Theodore H. White Lecture on the press and politics in his honor. Tonight, Teddy's son David and his wife and daughter are here with us. Please join me in expressing our thanks. This year, the White Lecture is to be delivered by David Brooks, one of the nation's most admired thinkers. I really don't think of him as a pundit, and my guess is that neither does he. He is rather someone who is a conservative thinker in the classic tradition. This is how he has described his brand of conservatism. Quote, if you define conservative by support for the Republican candidate or the belief that tax cuts are the correct answer to all problems, I guess I don't fit that agenda. But I do think that I'm part of a long-standing conservative tradition that has to do with Edmund Burke, which is be cautious. Don't think you can do all things by government planning. And Alexander Hamilton, who wanted to use government to help people compete in a capitalist society. That political philosophy has been enri enriched by a deep fascination with all kinds of things that I think could be said to fall under the heading in general of the human condition. For instance, David's latest book is called The Social Animal, The Hidden Sources of Love, Character, and Achievement. It is that mixture of politics and humanity that has made David Brooks an enduringly unpredictable voice and has made his op-ed column in the New York Times required reading for many of us. The core of his thinking for me is my sense that I am dealing with a man who, despite being a close observer of the world's follies, remains an optimist, a determined optimist, perhaps. I can honestly say also that I have never been more amazed by an op-ed column than the one he wrote in the New York Times on the eve of the Republican convention last summer, headlined, The Real Romney. It was that thing that is said to close on Saturday night, a satire, but it was a dead-on satire that seemed to cut in every direction at once. It was ostensibly an up-close and personal look at Mitt Romney, and it began Mitt Romney was born on March 12, 1947, in Ohio, Florida, Michigan, and Virginia, <laughs> and several other swing states. He emerged hair first, believing in America and especially in national parks. He was given the name Mitt after the Roman god of mutual funds <laughs> and launched into the world with the lofty expectation that he would someday become the arrow shirt man. That was the gentle part of the column. I mean, it had lots of zingers. But perhaps this was to be expected of a man who, at 22, got his big break after he did a satirical profile of William F. Buckley, Jr., which said, for instance, in the afternoons, he is in the habit of going into crowded rooms and making everybody else feel inferior. <laughs> Buckley apparently loved it and offered him a job at the National Review. From what I have heard, the Romney campaign was not so beguiled. And I have read that David Brooks has now forsworn ever trying to be funny again. I hope that is not true. What is true that he is not a reliable ally for any political figure. He has praised Barack Obama and pilloried him. He has lampooned Mitt Romney, but essentially endorsed him for president this time around. He has a restless mind and is not bound by any kind of party loyalty, but to a set of principles that he feels, clearly feels, and goes to pains to express and explain in his columns, to the fury of some conservatives and to the equal fury of some liberals. David Brooks was born in Toronto, grew up in New York City, took a degree in history from the University of Chicago. He has written many books, appeared in the pages of publications as diverse as the Weekly Standard and the New York Times, is a regular on PBS's NewsHour and a commentator on NPR. He is a man who reads and observes, and most of all, thinks. I am very eager to hear what he thinks 
about this moment in our political narrative. It is my honor to present the Theodore White Lecturer for 2012, David Brooks. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, naturally an honor and a privilege and humbling to be here, as humbled as a University of Chicago guy could be at Harvard. Uh, uh, I've spoken and visited Harvard many times, and I'll try to be brief because I know you didn't come here to hear me speak. Uh, you came here to hear yourself speak. And so <laughs> I'll try not to get in the way of that. Uh, let, let me say, first of all, it's a thrill to be back in Massachusetts. I have a rule with my punditry. I'll uh, be an interlocutor with any liberal commentator as long as they're Catholics from Boston. Uh, and so I do a PBS show with Mark Shields. We do a show called Shields and Brooks, though we thought it should be called Brook Shields. It would get a little better rating. <laughs> Mark has been doing it for a little while. He, um, now it's called Shields and Brooks. Before that, it was Shields and Chigo. Before that, it was Shields and Gergen. Before that, it was Shields and Coolidge. I think uh, before that, it was Shields and Thomas Aquinas, I think, originally. Uh, and so I, I do my PBS show with him. I do an NPR show uh, with my close friend uh, E.J. Dion, whose son James is a sophomore here at Harvard. Uh, and uh, he, E.J. is the only person I know whose eyes light up at the phrase panel discussion. Uh, <laughs> He is also unlike journalists uh, in that most of us are aloof. I always tell college students, if you have the sort of personality where you, um, if the whole football crowd is doing the wave and you sit still and you don't do the wave, then you have the sort of aloof personality required to be a journalist. Uh, but EJ is a hugger. He is uh, more a natural politician. Uh, as you know, politicians are invade your personal space, rub your face, rub, put their hands all over you. That's EJ. He's uh, more of a people person. I was in um, Aspen, Colorado two summers ago getting in touch with the real America and, um, and I uh, was walking down the street and I see Bill Clinton standing there watching a high school jazz band and he, uh, I go up to him, he starts talking to me about the quality of the saxophonist in the band and because he's him and I'm me, he has to drape himself around as he's talking and because I'm me, I'm cowering away so we move like 30 yards over the course of the song. Uh, and so E.J. has that ebullient personality and was a white lecturer. Uh, now, for every young journalist, there are certain older journalists who come before who have a formative influence on your life. And of course, I've had many. One of them, I was just in Kansas City this morning, I was reminded one of them was Calvin Trillin. Uh, was a huge influence on my life. I, when I got to know him, I once sent him an email. Uh, I just want you to know, uh, if not for you, I probably wouldn't have gone into journalism. And but Trilling, being somewhat to my left, sent me an email back and it said, let's keep that between ourselves. <laughs> uh, but another was, was Theodore White. Um, many people, I guess, started with the making of books and I've certainly graduated and read them. Though the first book uh, I read was uh, his history, uh, his memoir, In Search of History. And I vividly remember the day at my summer camp as a teenager, I read that book about being a Boston paper boy and coming here and seeing the life of a journalist. And then the second book I read uh, was his Watergate book, uh, Breach of Faith. Uh, and uh, it was a riveting look at, at that scandal. And of course, being me, uh, most people thought, you know, the journalists were the good guys. I was like, J Jeb Stuart Magruder is so cool. I want to do that. Uh, and so it was just a huge influence. Uh, and I'm grateful to be following him. And I'm certainly an honor to be with Cynthia uh, tonight. Uh, now, I, I'm going to talk about the uh, election results, and I think I'll follow a bit of what Cynthia said. Uh, the big takeaway from the election was that it marks a social transition. There are certain elections that are about social and historical transitions. The 1992 election was about a transition from a Cold War style of leadership uh, to a post-Cold War style of leadership. From George W. H. W. Bush to Bill Clinton, a more domestic-oriented, a less martial, maybe less imperial style of the presidency. Now the 2012 election was a shift from one demographic picture of America to another. And the first thing to be emphasized is that this shift is not anything dairy, daring and radical and new. Every company, almost, and every institution, almost, has gone from the shift 
from a white-dominated America to a globalized, diverse America. The lagging indicator was government, and the especial lagging indicator was the Republican Party. Harvard made this shift in 1952. In 1952, this institution was a white male institution. Two-thirds of the students who applied were admitted. If your father went to Harvard and you applied, there was a 90% chance you would get in. The median SAT score for freshmen in 1952 was 583, which is fine, but not where it is today. And it was the embodiment of the WASP culture. Now, because I'm a conservative, I have some affection for that culture. I came from a Jewish background in New York where our phrase was, uh, think Yiddish, act British. Uh, we, Jews in New York, we gave ourselves names for a certain generation, all these English WASP names so nobody would know we were Jewish. They were names like Irving, Sidney, Milton. Didn't exactly work. The WASPs, and I grew up with them on the main line of Philadelphia, had a libido for the ugly. And so the men would wear these duck pants, the women these floral gowns so they look like hydrangea bushes walking down the street. <laughs> but they did have a character code that I find admirable, and they did have a code of reticence that I find admirable. I remember covering the George H.W. Bush campaign, where he was, came from that code, and so the campaign staff could never get him to talk about himself. They'd say, you know, you're running for president, tell them how great you are. And he'd say, no, nah, I don't want to. And they'd finally beat him up, and two weeks later, he'd finally say, okay, I'll talk about it myself. He'd give one speech. His mom, who was still, then still alive, would call him and say, George, you're talking about yourself again. <laughs> and he would clam back up. But that was one culture. And in 19, early 1950s, James Bryan Conant and the admissions director, Henry Chauncey, decided this can't be Harvard's future. Facing the Soviet Union, looking around at America, you got to change what Harvard is. And so they, in the 1950s, went through the transition that the Republican Party still hasn't gone through. And they became a div more diverse, increasingly as the years went by, more modern, while still remaining Harvard. In fact, remaining more Harvard maybe than they were. And so they preserved the essence of this place by transitioning, and by 1960, the median SAT score was not in the 570s, it was 680 verbal. And that's a tremendous change. And they created a change in the culture. We now have a new style of elite. You go to an elementary school and you see the kids uh, from upper, upper middle class suburb, they've got their 80 pound backpacks on, they're trying to get into Harvard. The moms are uh, these characters I call uber moms who are highly successful career women who've taken time off to make sure all their kids can get into Harvard. Uh, you can usually tell the Uber moms because they actually weigh less than their own children. Uh, sort of at the moment of conception, they're doing little butt exercises at the <laughs> delivery room, cutting the umbilical cord, flashing little Mandarin flashcards at little things so it can pass the admissions committee, raising their kids to be the junior workaholics of America. Uh, and so this is the new Harvard. And one of the lessons of this election is that the Obama Harvard defeated the Romney Harvard that the new thing that he embodies, Obama embodies, defeated the reticent, more button-down culture than Mitt Romney embodies. And so this was a shift. And so what specifically is this shift that we're talking about? Well, part of it is the part that Cynthia talked about, the obvious part of ethnicity. When Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980, whites made up 88% of the electorate. This time they made up around 72% of the electorate. If you just take that decline and assume that Republicans are essentially a 98% white party, then every four years the Republicans are losing on net 1.5% of their base. Boom, 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 boom. And so that's not good. And the rise of Latinos, and especially, I think most interesting of all, in this election, the rise of Asian Americans who went three to one for Mitt Romney. There's a group that's more educated than the average American, better, uh, richer than the average American, more entrepreneurial. The people the Republicans celebrate voted three to one for the opponents. And I spent a couple days last week looking at Pew Research data on Latino values and Asian American values, and two things leap out. One, a ferocious commitment to work, greater than the average white American. And second, great affection for those parts of government that help them work more. And so when the Republican Party says it's government versus dependency, that just doesn't ring true to a lot of those people, no matter how rich and entrepreneurial they are. And so that's one, the ethnic shift. 
But that's not the only shift. The second shift is the shift in household structures. In the old um, Harvard, in the old America, the 1950s, we were essentially a culture oriented around the two-parent family. And even in 1970, when you ask people, are people who don't want to have two parent, members of two-parent families, are people who don't want to have children, are they neurotic or psychotic? 70 or 80% of Americans would say, yes, those people are strange. We were tremendously oriented around the two-parent family. Now, in 1980, 9% of Americans lived alone. Today, 28% of Americans lived alone. In 1990, 65% of Americans said children were required for a successful marriage. Now, 41% say that. Now, there are more houses in America with dogs than there are with kids. And so we have become domestically, a much more diverse set of family structures. And this, by the way, we are the lagging indicator in the world. In Scandinavia, 45% of the people live alone. In Singapore, marriage rates and fertility rates have plummeted. In Brazil, the fertility rate has gone from about 4.1 per woman to 1.7 per woman. So we are sort of behind the curve in the diversity of family structure. And this translates into political alliances. The Republican Party, Mitt Romney, easily won among married people, including married women. Among single people, Obama won, he crushed Romney, 62-35. So the second big shift after ethnicity is the shift in family culture. The third big shift is what you might call the end of the rising tide. There had been a belief that a rising tide would lift all boats, and it was sufficient to campaign on the notion, I will improve the business climate, and that improvement in the business climate will translate down to everybody else. That the economy is one thing, basically. I think a lot of Americans no longer believe that, and for good reason. The first reason that's no longer true is they just look at productivity rates and wage growth, and these two are no longer linked. And so that's broken. The second thing they do is they look at the inequality of social capital. And here I'm relying on a lot of work by people like Robert Putnam here and others. When you look at people who are in situations where it's hard to gather social capital, and no matter how the economy is doing, they have trouble achieving social mobility. And so in 1964, high school educated families and college educated families had essentially the same demographics, the same style of divorce rates, the same child rearing rates. Now there's a total discontinu discontinuity between these two groups. People with college degrees have about a third of the divorce rates, third of the obesity rates, third of the smoking rates. Putnam's work shows that over the last 20 or 30 years, college-educated people have, have, in, have devoted about $6,000 per year per kid to each child extracurricular activities, to travel teams, to SAT prep, to oboe practice. Educated, uh, high school-educated people don't have that kind of money. As a result, college-educated kids do many more extracurriculars, just much better prepared. And so if you come from a family making $96,000 a year, your odds of getting through college are one in two. If you come from a family making 36000 your odds are one in 17. So basically the gap, it's not one economy anymore. And so we're at the end of the rising tide era. Republicans, these are the three big transitions. Republicans have not done well in these transitions. And I don't blame Mitt Romney. I think the party was a drag on him more than he was a drag on the party. I think he ran a pretty decent campaign. He doesn't have the natural social skills if you ran into Mitt Romney uh, at Aspen, Colorado. He wouldn't drape himself over you. But he learned to fake being a good politician, as so much else. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, um, I remember covering him in um, New Hampshire uh, during the primary, and he was out campaigning with his five perfect sons, Bip, Chip, Rip, Sip, Skip, and Lip, and Dip. Uh, and uh, he goes into a diner, uh, and he introduces himself to each family at the diner, and he asks them what village in New Hampshire are you from, and then he described the home he owned in their village. And he goes around from whole, the whole thing, and he's met like 30 people and he's memorized their names, so when he goes out, he, he first names them all. That's a level of political skill. People thought he was divorced from real America because he had this house in La Jolla where he had all these garages with elevators in the garages. And I defended him from that. I said he has a lot of other houses with no elevators in the garages. 
so. Uh, no, I thought he was a fine candidate. He was a good debater, better than most. And I thought a decent speaker by the end. The problem was not him, the problem was the party, and you can judge that by looking at the senatorial candidates versus him, even in places like Texas, where the senator did worse than he did. So the party of conservatism, its job is to conserve. And its job is to defend a frontier ethos, a moral vocabulary that's been used to talking in, in which, which has made the country great. And that is the virtue of the conservative party. But it does mean when you're at moments of historical transition, like the one we're now in, you're gonna get caught on the wrong side of a lot of trends. And I think the Republicans got caught on the wrong side of these trends which I've described. And now it's interesting, there's a debate within the party about what to do. First, do nothing, get a better candidate. Second, say the same stuff in Spanish. <laughs> uh, third, just fix immigration policy. And fourth, which is the side of truth and justice, which is my side, uh, which is, it's about economic values. It's a terrible mistake, as I said, to divide everything between government activism and dependency, to link those two things, because a lot of government programs don't lead to dependency, not Pell Grants, and not early childhood education. It's a big mistake to make big government the opposite of small government, and that is the core debate. Because for a lot of people, some parts of government are good, some are not. And if you're talking about big government and small government to a family that's trying to get their kid through community college, they think, what are you talking about? And so to me, it's about economic values. It's about the Republican Party being the, va the party of, of creative destruction, of social mobility, of anything that'll get people to work harder and make Democrats the party of economic security and equality. That's a normal debate to have. But that would involve changing your attitudes towards government. And we'll see if they can do that. I think it'll take a couple more defeats. The Democrats have obviously profited from being on the right side of these achievements. But I have to say they now face the consequences of these demographic shifts. First, the area of family diversity is an area of a lot of social chaos, especially for those where family formation is not happening and the breakdown of social capital that goes with the destruction of family structures. What's the democratic response to that? I think there is one, but it hasn't really been articulated. Second, the aging of society and the costs of debt. How do you, if you want to sustain the welfare state, you really have to reform Medicare. What's the democratic response to that? Third, economic stagnation caused by the gradual sclerosis of stable institutions. We have a tax code that's about 78,000 pages. We have a regulatory code that's 168,000 pages. As a result, partly of these problems and our human capital problems, the, the normal growth rate for the past 60 years was 3.3% a year. The projected growth rate for the next 30 years, even after we get out of the recession, will be 2.3%. That difference between 3.3 and 2.3 is actually gigantic. It's 5 million jobs over the next two, 20 years. And so how do you boost that up? And I, in my position, the Democratic Party has become too, too addicted to cyclical stimulus and hasn't thought enough about structural change to raise the normal growth rate. Now, it's been funny over these years to watch President Obama. I was uh, and remain a personal great admirer of him. I started with the, the, uh, the, you know, the Messiah era, uh, when he would be carried into rooms by little cherubs, and he would come down, and what sort of wine would you like me to turn your water into, that sort of thing. Um, and he had, at those days, the wind at his back. And I loved it covering him because they felt, the people around Obama felt so comfortable and so happy with themselves in the world. And so when he, I would criticize him, usually when you criticize a president or a candidate, some, a staffer will call you the next day and say, you're a complete and total asshole. Uh, with the Obama people, they'd call and say, David, we really like you, we respect your work. It's so sad you're a complete and total asshole. But you would, uh, it, would, it would make you feel, feel better about it. Um, and so they had that wind at their backs. And he had an ease and comfort about him and a self-confidence. But it's been funny, fun, interesting to watch him over the years uh, become more aggrieved with Washington, more hardened about what you have to do, more sour about uh, what, what has to be done, more insular in who he trusts in the White House. Every White House I've covered has a smaller circle of trust than the one before, and this has certainly continued the trend. Uh, and. Uh, I think he's also replaced the big personalities at the beginning of the first term with 
more loyal but less creative personalities, that each, principal, each person with a principal personality who left, like Larry Summers, was replaced by somebody with a staffer personality. And so it's become a more hardened group. And each successive interview, you see him getting hardened, hardened. not Machiavellian, but tougher and more bloody-minded. And just Wednesday, he had an off-the-record session with a couple of us columnists, and that has certainly continued post-victory. There's a sense there's a lot of nonsense going on in Washington, and I'm going to take care of it. That would be the underlying tone. And so his attitude to the fiscal cliff is what it's been reported. He's raising what the ask for Republicans. And frankly, in the short term, I have some doubts about his strategy about the fiscal cliff. In my view, if you want to get a deal, you have to give your opponents the chance to get to yes. You have to give them an avenue that does not require complete capitulation and humiliation. And I'm sure he's giving them that path. But I assume he'll win the, this fight over taxes. The, all the structures and all the public opinion polls are in his direction. My big concern is, do you want to just get to the end of your term with the deficits at about 3%? Or do you want to fundamentally change the dynamics that are causing us to have a long-term debt problem? The fundamental structures. To me, the only way you can deal with the fundamentals is by having a deal. By doing it, both parties together and walking it off, walking off the cliff together. If you're going to be so confrontational early in the term, you're never going to get that deal. You will solve the immediate fiscal cliff problem. You will not change the fundamental structures because you won't have laid the bipartisan predicate for that. And so that's what disturbs me about the strategy. Nonetheless, I think he's right on the merits. We should raise taxes on the top 2% and won't we'll do any economic harm at all. But I do think he has been changed by circumstances and having been bloodied has become more bloody minded in a way that's probably not in our long term interest. Nonetheless, we go forward. A lot of work for people at Harvard to do. A lot of work for academics to do to solve these fundamental new circumstances by the shift. How do you create national university amidst ethnic diversity? How do you create stable societies with new family structures? How do you restore the rising tide of social mobility? How do you create aging societies that are affordable? How do you create morally upright people in an age of intense individualism and personal freedom? These are tremendous intellectual challenges for anybody in an institute. And so I've decided to spend a lot more time in academia. And I decided uh, last year that I was going to go to the place most likely to provide the intellectual insights to yield the future. And so starting in January, I'm teaching at Yale University. <laughs> bula bula. <laughs> Thank you. Was, was that supposed to be funny? <laughs> Um, David is going to uh, answer questions. Uh, I would, uh, we have mics here, 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 and there. I would ask uh, you to observe the ground rules, which are uh, identify yourself, uh, make your question a question, a genuine question, not a speech, and, uh, and you know, keep it short if possible. Thank you. Go ahead. Good evening. Um, my name is Auden Lawrence, and I'm a freshman at the college, and I would like to ask you the following question on behalf of the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum Committee. Um, so stemming from the writing you have done about qualities people had decades ago, and also some of what you alluded to in your speech, strength, resilience, decision-making capabilities, um, what do you believe needs to happen in our world, whether it be in the education system or something else, that will foster these qualities as we look to the future? Uh, th those virtues you described? Yeah, okay, I have an answer to that. Because uh, I spent a lot of time with college students looking into your souls. Uh, and <laughs> I'm really good at knowing what's in there. Uh, uh, I guess I would say uh, one thing. First, when you take a look at, I'm going to focus on the, the training of the young. When you take a look at the generation under 35, first, it's a generation of intense social repair. And so all the social indicators that went south in the 60s are now heading in the right direction, mostly driven by demographics of people under 35. So crime is down by 70%, divorce is down significantly, teenage pregnancy is down by a third, abortion rates are down by a third, domestic violence is down 
all sorts of social indicators heading in the right direction because of young people. I think you're all going to have the biggest midlife crisis in human history in about 10 years, <laughs> but until then. But here's the one thing that I think is the essential trait for leadership that is lacking in basically a lot of the generations, including my own. Uh, and that's a sense, an acute awareness of personal weakness and how to combat against it. And so just two quick statistics. In 1950, uh, and this is my nostalgia for the old order. In 1950, the Gallup organization asked high school seniors, are you a very important person? And in 1950, 12% said yes. They asked the same question in 2005, and it was 80% who said yes. <laughs> There's something called the narcissism test where psychologists give students a bunch of statements and they say, does this apply to you? And uh, there are statements like, I like to be the center of attention, I find it easy to manipulate people, uh, somebody should write a biography about me, things like that. <laughs> and the median score in the narcissism test has ridden, risen by 30% over the last 20 years. And so I would say that people, in, frankly, in the 1950s, and none of us would ever want to go back there, just to make that clear, but we're raised with a sense of character, of weakness, and the strategies you need to develop that. I'll just tell one quick story, uh, Dwight Eisenhower. When he was eight, he wanted to go out trick-or-treating. His mom wouldn't let him because he was too young, so he, he threw a temper tantrum, punched the tree in his front yard, and bloodied all his knuckles because he was in a temper tantrum. Mom sent him to his room, made him cry for an hour, went up to see him, uh, and she quoted, as she was binding his wounds, she quoted a verse which was, he that conquereth his own soul is greater than he who taketh a city. And Eisenhower said that was the most important conversation in his life because it taught him that he was weak and he needed to combat his own sinfulness, basically. And I would say people like him and George Marshall and Francis Perkins, who were raised with that ethos, had an advantage in the leadership skills. So that's my nostalgia for the 1950s. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Danny Hattam. I'm a second year grad student here at the Kennedy School, and I'm a Burkean conservative. And my question is about uh, the social order inversion that you talked about, that Obama and the new social order defeated the Republican Romney version of the old order. But when you were speaking about George H.W. Bush, those Yankee qualities, the reticence, humility, introversion, caution, aren't these exactly the kind of fundamentally conservative uh, qualities that America just chose in Barack Obama? Uh, that, well, that's a, <laughs> there is a strong Burkean case uh, for Obama based on uh, his sense of prudence. I do think he's a very cautious person. Where I think he's not a Burkean is that he has a, I think, a strong faith in central planning. And so he has a strong faith, say that if you get the smartest people in a room, then they can design a system that will solve problems. And so, for example, uh, the, uh, the American Affordable Care Act has uh, this board to control the cost of Medicare, 17 people sitting in Washington to control the Medicare system. I don't think Burke would think they know enough about reality to control it from Washington. The Dodd-Frank finance reform bill, instead of having a dumb, simple rule like uh, break up the banks, which to me, which would reflect a measure of epistemological modesty, we don't know, we're just going to do something dumb and simple. They have a very complicated rule that puts a lot of power in the knowledge or a lot of faith in the knowledge of federal regulators, which I think a faith which is unjustified. So in some ways, he is a Burkean, and he is certainly a Niborian in foreign policy, but in his faith in central planning separates him from that and makes him more technocratic, I would say. David, David Marshall, a visiting fellow from, uh, at, the, at the law school here. Um, where is the intellectual address now for the conservative movement in this country? Because this campaign, the Weekly Standard, Fox News, the National Review, all seem to have lost the plot utterly. Where is the intellectual heart now? Where, where does the debate take place over the next few years? It's walking down the hallway in Fox News. It's one, looking for the opinion desk. Uh, uh, no, no, no. Uh, well, I, I guess first I don't agree uh, about those magazines. I do think there is, you know, a moment. It, it takes a bunch of elections in a row to defeat the tribal mentality. When I worked for Buckley, um, we were conservatives. We were not Republicans. There was a sharp distinction. Republicans were the opportunists who would sell you out. And conservatism had its strength because it grew up out of power. And so it, people had neckties, Adam Smith necktie, Edmund Burke necktie. 
Liberalism, on the other hand, in those days grew up in power with the New Deal, and so liberals were less aware of their philosophic founders, but probably more programmatically astute. And so, but over the years, conservatism has been absorbed by the Republican Party in a tribal and conscious sense, if not in a practical sense or d distinct sense. So to me, you gotta look at people outside. And I would say the promising centers of conservatism, A, are some of the young people, people under 40 who were never around for the Reagan revolution and don't have a, uh, a personal devotion to the mythology of what they think Reagan was. And so those are some people like my colleague Ross Douthat, uh, who went here. Uh, he wrote a book uh, with a, a, a former colleague, Raihan Salam, which is more about a working class conservatism. And I think that's one very vibrant branch. I would read in a magazine called National Affairs, which is, I think, one of the smartest uh, magazines. It's sort of the pre a follower on to the public interest. And then the second, where I think there's a lot of intellectual creativity, is in the bloggers surrounding a magazine called The American Conservative. There are a bunch of young people there who are more communitarian, a little more paleocon. And they speak to a conservatism which is not my style, but which is much more isolationism, almost be canonized in foreign affairs. But I just find them very interesting and very more Russell Kirkian style conservatism. And I have to say, if I were a complete opportunist starting a political party right now, I would take a younger version of Pat Buchanan and a younger version of Ralph Nader and merge them together, and I think you'd really have something. The kind of, it wouldn't be what I would want, but there'd be a lot of energy for that. <laughs> How's it going, Mr. Brooks? Um, I'm Tom Snyder. I'm a senior at the college right now. Um, I'm from Syracuse, New York, which is upstate, if you don't necessarily know that. Although you're from I've been there. Toronto, been there, so you yeah. would. Um, but, you know, the 1950s were a really great time for Syracuse, as they were for a lot of Rust Belt cities. What I'm interested in is uh, what would modern day conservatism's economic policies, specifically free markets, do to bring back economic, um, economic growth and economic stability to a place like Syracuse or Cleveland or Detroit? And uh, if you could just elaborate on what, what you think it could do. Yeah. Well, I was in Erie, Pennsylvania, two nights ago, which is sort of close there. It's a city that's hurting. Uh, and so it's funny, uh, there's, there's been a lot of 1950s nostalgia um, conservatives were nostalgic for the social structure of the 1950s. Liberals are nostalgic for the economic structures of the 1950s. And of course, neither are coming back. And so my answer for places like Syracuse or Erie, um, I'm, I don't know if it qualifies as conservative, but I do think it's right. <laughs> uh, and it follows on the book that was written here called The Race Between Education and Technology. Uh, and it basically says you've got to start with human capital policies. And to me, you have to start with stable families for kids in the first three or five years of life. So I would, I think human capital, building human capital is like nutrition. You start and you do it a bit every day. And it would start with prenatal care. It would start with nurse family visits for single moms. It would start with early childhood education. It would go up to charter schools, mentorship programs, boys and girls clubs. My basic view is we do not know what causes poverty. And it, when there's a situation that's so complex you don't know what causes it, you have to flood the zone and try everything at once. Sort of Harlem Children's Zone type models. And so that's not an easy answer because if you say you really do succeed with these kids, it still takes 30 years till they're workers. And so I don't know an answer for the 55 year old guy who's laid off. But I do think that's the answer. It's sort of intense human capital policies at the bottom, at the bottom edge of the age scale. My name is Alex Remington. I'm a second year master's in public policy candidate. Um, thank you very much for coming. I wanted to ask about a couple of your recent columns. One, um, uh, right before the election, you wrote that you believe that Mitt Romney would be more able to uh, is effectively govern as a compromiser in, in the White House, would be more effectively able to reach across the aisle uh, than Barack Obama, both because of the Democratic and Republican parties uh, that sit in the sitting caucuses and also their personal styles. And then more recently, you wrote a piece called The Party of Work, in which you stated that the Republican Party needed to seriously engage in research uh, to determine what sort of policies would foster that kind of human capital development you were talking about. If Obviously, that kind of policy development takes time. If you were going, if you were a strategist advising the sitting, the sitting Republican caucus in the House and Senate, 
in the next two to four years, working with this president again still, what would you say to them? I guess the first thing is, and this is my comment about all the super PACs, if I were sitting with a bunch of, um, uh, a bunch of Republican billionaires, my message would be spend less on marketing, more on product development. And so they spent hundreds of billions of dollars on um, ads and making the rubble bounce. Uh, Amy probably knows this better than I, but I think I read this, that uh, if you took all the ads that ran in Ohio in the last month and tried to watch them back to back, it would take you 80 days or something like that. <laughs> so all that money, do we really think that was, spent, that was money well spent? So spend money on finding out what it takes for a kid in Syracuse or Akron to rise. And, you know, I'm a Hamiltonian. Uh, Hamilton, uh, when he was 12, his, his mom died in the bed next to him. His father had run away. He was adopted by his uncle um, who died. He was adopted by his grandparents who died. And so by 14, he had nothing. By 25, he had retired as the most successful Treasury Secretary. Or, or, um, I'm, I'm sorry, by 25, he was George Washington's Chief of Staff, uh, a war hero. By 35, he'd helped write the Federalist Papers, successful lawyer. By 45 or so, he'd, he'd retired as the Treasury Secretary. It's a story of awesome social mobility. And that is, um, that's the kind of system he helped design through some industrial policy and a bunch of other policies to give poor boys and girls like him the chance to succeed. That tradition was taken up by the Whig Party. It was taken up by Abraham Lincoln and the early Republican Party. It seems to me that tradition, giving people the tools to compete in a capitalist economy, is the missing tradition in American life. And you can't just be a party that's for freedom. You have to be for this mobility. And marrying those two traditions is the way you do it. And the Republicans walked away from this tradition. And so I would tell them to study what Lincoln did, what Hamilton did, and then study what it takes today to rise and be mobile. Uh, and, I mean, that would be it. Hi, thank you again for coming and speaking. Um, my name is Mark Diaz Truman. I'm a second year public policy student here at the Kennedy School. Um, so I'm an uh, American Latino, I'm from New Mexico, um, and those, those groups uh, from a sort of rural state and from that particular group are not honestly well served by either party. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, one of my frustrations has been watching the Democrats in sort of a one party rule system to not really deliver on some of the promises that they've, they've made. Now while my broader political allegiance tilts that way, I have a strong interest in seeing the Republican Party embrace this sort of issue and, and take it on for no other reason than pure market competition. So my question to you is, what can Latinos do to get the Republican Party to be an opposition party on Latino issues? Well, if you don't really believe in, I mean, you can't, you can infiltrate the party. <laughs> Um, but if you don't sort of believe in its basic principles, I, well, yeah, I'm just saying, what can, if, what can people outside the party do to make people, in, well, inside the party behave better, um, be nice, <laughs> talk to them. Uh, you know, I, I do think um, it, so much of our problems in the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are about epistemic closure, this phrase that is now dominated. Uh, and if you want an example of people who are in information cocoons, you know, Karl Rove walking down or sending somebody down the hallway, that's a perfect example. And just so liberals don't feel good, I want to re recite some research that Jonathan Haidt puts in his book, The Righteous Mind. They took a bunch of conservatives and liberals and gave them questionnaires on a series of policy issues. And they said, uh, answer these as you would like, as your, to reflect your own views on taxes, abortion, and then they said to conservatives, answer it the way a liberal would answer it. And then they said to liberals, answer it the way a conservative would answer it. And conservatives were very good at predicting the mean liberal answer. Liberals are terrible at predicting the conservative answer. Conserv liberals know very little about conservatives. So the information closure goes both ways. But I do think it's very, it's very, it's one thing to talk about big government in the abstract and to talk about dependency in the abstract as abstractions. And it's, a very, it's another thing to have face-to-face -face names and personal contact with people going through certain experiences. And so I do think it's, it's basically that as simple as, you know, making sure the next Mitt Romney spends a lot of time in, you know, your neighborhood or some other neighborhood. I do believe in that basic sensitivity. And by the way, I, I often ask people in government, especially academics, what did you learn being in government that you didn't know beforehand? And one of the answers I got from a recent president was, um, 
There's a lot of passive aggressive behavior in government that I didn't appreciate. That I'm president, I give an order, nothing happens. Uh, but one of the answers I got was that I used to think government was like 75% policy making with 75% personalities and relationships. Now I realize it's 98% personalities and relationships. It's about the intimate bonds. And if there's no intimate bonds with certain demographic groups, there's going to be no really ability to express that. And by the way, that is one of my problems with President Obama, who not only I don't think has the intimate bonds, let alone with Republicans, even with Democrats on Capitol Hill, but doesn't, I know, does not think he needs to develop more intimate bonds. I just think that's a mistake. We'll take three more questions. Yes, up here. Hi. My name is John. I'm a sophomore at the college. Thank you so much for your speech. Um, I have a very simple question. Um, you outlined the uh, transition that is going on, and you mentioned some of the options that the Republican Party had. Where do you think the uh, Tea Party stands in this, and what do you think will happen to them, and what do you think should happen uh, with regards to you know the relationship between the Republican Party and the Tea Party? Yeah. Uh, well, I guess. I have to say, I at first thought they were a mixed but positive blessing for the Republican Party, simply because they, um, they brought so much energy in 2010 happened. But now I think it's very hard to argue they're a positive blessing. The Republicans would have at least, I think, four more Senate seats, if not for their influence. I had lunch with the fourth most conservative senator uh, in the Republican Party a couple of months ago, and he said, you know, my, every day I think about being primaried. Uh, I think that somebody's going to run against me from the right. And if this guy, who is the fourth most conservative person in the Senate, is afraid of being primaried, everybody's afraid of it. And watch Mitch McConnell for the next two years. And so I do think they have a, a, a negative influence, at, uh, first on political level, and second on the economic level, by turning economic issues into, into culture war issues. They've imported the culture war style of arguing into economic discussions which should be about dollars and numbers. And so I do think that's, um, that's just psychologically harmful for the party. Uh, and so what do you do with a recalcitrant group that doesn't fundamentally believe in compromise? Uh, well, the first thing you can do is exercise them from the party, which is what, um, frankly, Bill Buckley did to the John Birch Society. But I don't think, I think that A, they're too big, and B, they're not as marginal as the John Birch Society was. So you get them to change their mind without ever admitting they're changing their minds. I was really struck by the fact that as Mitt Romney moved to the center, there wasn't a peep from the Tea Party. They're fundamentally driven, like most people in America today, by partisanship, not by philosophy. And so if they see a Republican winning, they'll be fine. But you just can't let them control the message. My name is Teresa Chui, and I've been visiting from Philadelphia where 59, per 59 precincts uh, in Philadelphia casted no votes for Mitt Romney. Um, my observation here uh, in Massachusetts in the last month and in Pennsylvania and New Jersey is that our political culture has become really coarse because of the role of money in it, especially the Supreme Court decision, Citizens United. I've been door knocking since I was 16. I'm now 48. I had so many doors slammed on May in 10 that it really sent um, me reading a lot about that decision. I would like you to comment on its role in your understanding of where we're headed. Yeah. Uh, first, let me say, uh, I think Steve Hess, who's here, who said which something I agree with. This was the worst campaign uh, I've ever covered. It was just the, the most unpleasant, the least substantive, uh, Romney was all over the place. Obama was almost entirely negative. Uh, the mood was bad. It was just a rotten. I can understand why people were slamming doors. It was just the worst. Uh, second, as for the role of money, I think that is down the list in the causes. First, I have a somewhat heterodoxical and maybe wrong view of the role of money. I don't think money is very important in changing people's votes. I've seen various studies where they line up the amount of dollars spent and the margin of victory over the historic average for a district. And there's no straight line relating money to results. It's just a scattering of dots with no pattern. And so as I said, I think if once you get up to a certain threshold of spending, all the money spent above that is just making the rubble bounce. I do not think money matters much in a presidential race, though it matters a little more down ballot. Second, I nonetheless think money is corrupting because politicians think it matters. 
and therefore they spend all their money, A, chasing the dollars, and B, just they don't want pain. If they're in the House race and they want to reform taxes and they want to get rid of some loophole for an oil deduction, uh, and they know it's going to cause them to somebody to um, dump a $5 million into their district against them, they're not going to do it. Uh, and I've had interviews with the Kochs, and their, their deal is very simple. We will give you X millions of dollars to win, but if you vote against us, we will give X millions of dollars for somebody to run against you. It'll be a one-to-one -one spend. So you always have to vote for us. You can never compromise with the other side. And so that's the deal. That's a contract. And so that discourages compromise. It discourages offending those interests. And so it has an effect on policy making. I don't think it has a big effect on elections, especially at the presidential level. Last question. Um, my name is Felicity Spector. I'm a journalist for Britain's Channel 4 News. Um, I wanted to ask, basically, right after the election, there was a lot of comment about how this was now the dawn of a new liberal America. There were all these new um, women elected to the, to the Hill. There was um, ballot initiative supporting gay marriage. There are some more lesbian and gay people in Congress. Do you think that's enough to overcome the deep partisanship which has been building up for the last four years? I mean, President Obama came in in 2008 wanting to change Washington. He now wants to change Washington. Does Washington need to want to change itself, and can you see that happening? Well, first, uh, I'm not sure he wants to change Washington anymore. He just wants to fight by the old rules, uh, but win this time. Uh, but I would say I would, I, it's, a, it's the, I think it's in the Constitution that each party after each election has to overread its mandate. Uh, and so I would say that um, uh, the Democrats, it's funny, they, they know they can't overread the mandate. It's become a truism in democratic circles to say, I don't believe in mandates. Nonetheless, we should get everything we want. Uh, and so they, I think they're doing a little of overreading. It's worth mentioning that um, although this was a clear win for the Democrats, most congressional districts and probably most precincts were slightly more conservative in their voting patterns than they were four years ago. And so this was not a liberal tide. This was an anti-Republican tide. And my, and my, my this is, um, I hope that there are probably real political scientists here, but I have a, a bogus political science theory, which I admit is bogus, but it explains things to me. And it's based on a real political scientist by a guy named Sammy Lubell, who had a theory we had a, a sun party and a moon party. The sun party is the natural majority party at that time, and the moon party basks in its reflective glory. That's the minority party. And so the Democrats used to be the Sun Party after the New Deal. The Republicans were the Sun Party after the um, Reagan Revolution. And then in the 90s, there were basically two, they were tied. My view right now is that we have two moon parties. We have two minority parties. And voters vote against whichever party they hate most at that moment. But it doesn't mean they're really affixed to the, the party they happen to elect in. And if you think that's, if you disagree with me, I can show you a lot of Republicans who are really happy after 2010. And so I think that these mandates are extremely tentative. Uh, and so I do not think we've entered a liberal America. If you do the raw opinion poll, I think there are probably 40% of Americans call themselves uh, conservative, 20% um, call themselves liberal, and 35 are in the middle there. That's historic constant almost. David Brooks, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Can I say one thing? Oh, sure, sure. I, I just want to say one quick thing. I, I, um, I am teaching at Yale. I did go to Chicago. They're much better schools than Harvard. But as I look around this room, I see a lot of uh, people who have taught me a lot, Gardner, Nat, Nick Burns. Uh, I'm just appreciative of the power, uh, intellectual power uh, of this place. So I'm honored to have uh, people I see in the audience here, and I thank you. We, we tried to make this as much as possible look like a degree. <laughs> before, we, uh, before we adjourn, that we will be, that David Brooks and Cynthia Tucker, as well as John Dickerson, um, uh, Jennifer Hoschild and Amy Walter will be at the Charles Hotel Kennedy Room, which is on the ground floor, tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock for a discussion about the things and the 
the points of, uh, of, of David Brooks's lecture tonight that, uh, that require more conversation. We hope that many of you will come. You're all welcome. Again, thank you all. Thank you, David.